<laughs> All right, Mike is on now. Um, my name is Scott Roller. I'm the instructor up here at Billiard Factory. Uh, mentioned I'm doing a kind of an A to Z master class series on pool. That I think I'm going to end up with about eight sessions, so this is number three. Um, the first one I'm going to reshoot because we got the camera equipment after I started the series. Um, so look for that in the future. I think we're going to do that in the next week or two. Uh, last month we covered shot making, which was all about different ways to, uh, different aiming systems and different ways to make balls and use caroms and combos and all that. Um, that is saved right now on the Facebook page for Billiard Factory. Uh, today we're talk going to talk about spin. Uh, shot making is great. And technically you don't need spin to make any of the balls that you're trying to make. But none of us want to shoot very, very difficult shots over and over and over again. We want to shoot nice, easy shots. So I'm going to talk about cue ball spin today and different ways to alter the cue ball path so that you can get nice and close on the next object ball, get the right angles on the next object ball. And then we're going to kind of use all that knowledge next month to talk about position play and patterns and uh, where you want to be when you're actually using the spin to get the proper angle. First thing I want to talk about, which I think is probably the most important, is stop shot. Stop shot is basically when you hit another object ball full in the face and the cue ball is sliding at impact. So just from a pure physics standpoint, and I'll use a stripe ball just to kind of demonstrate. So if I'm sitting here and I have a perfectly straight in shot and I hit the cue ball with, let's say if I'm close, like a foot away, if I hit it at center ball, or pretty close to center, this ball is actually going to and when it hits this ball it won't have any spin and it'll stop dead in place and then it'll transfer all the energy to the, the object ball, the object ball go in the pocket. Um, so I'll kind of show you that real quick. And again when you're pretty close like this you really can hit just about center ball. Okay, so you can actually see that ball came back just a hair, which means I hit it just a hair below center. And again, when I when I try to practice stop shots, I try to practice them so the ball stops dead. Because typically in a game, if it comes back a half inch or an inch or goes forward a half inch or an inch, usually you're you're okay. Uh, occasionally you have to play very tight position and it's necessary to get it perfect. Um, from about two feet away, For you to hit center ball, you actually have to hit the ball pretty hard. And I don't like really trying to pocket balls at a really hard speed. Reduces the effective size of the pocket. Uh, you can't really hit the rail anymore going into the pocket. You can't really hit the outside of the facing. So I like to keep it at a nice smooth speed. So from about two feet away, I want to hit about a quarter tip below center. I have to go a little bit below center. So I'll show you kind of what that looks like. And you might be able to see that the ball's got just a hair of backward rotation on it and then it's going to be sliding before it makes contact. Okay, so you saw it had that backward rotation and when it hit it just stopped. So that concept of the stop shot is really important number one for cue ball control a lot of times when you hit a shot you kind of want to soften it up a bit. You want to be able to hit the ball and keep the cue ball somewhere near where you made contact. And it also formulates, uh, or, or uh, that's how you want to hit the ball when you're at an angle in order to go down the tangent line for position. Is there anybody here that isn't aware of the tangent line and the 90 degree line that off the ball when you hit, when you, uh, when you hit a stop shot? Okay, so let me show that real quick. So again, I'm going to be about two feet away. And I have an angle now, so I, I can't stop the cue ball anymore. Uh, if I have an angle, even if I hit a stop shot, perfect, it's going to travel somewhat because of the angle. So. The way you can tell how, where it's going to travel is if you look at the contact, which would be OK, 
Okay, so I'll put the three at contact. So if I look at the tangent line, that's basically a 90 degree line between the two edges of the balls. So if I project that over here, this is the center of the line, but the cue ball is actually going to travel on the path the cue ball is. So if I move this over, that is the path the cue ball is going to take, and if the ball is perfectly sliding a contact, the cue ball will come right here. So I will mark that, and I'll see how accurate I can hit this. Now I have to hit this a little harder. This ball, uh, probably just about center ball. Okay, so I missed the ball, which I overcut it, so you can see that that's why the cue ball went a little forward. Let me set up another shot. And we'll redo the same thing. And I'll aim it this time. Okay, so it's going to land right here, so it's going to be about right there. Okay, so again, it went a little forward, and that's because I hit just a hair too high. So it's really important when you're playing position to be pretty accurate with um, with your hit position. If I hit a little low on the cue ball, it's going to come backward from that spot. If I hit a little high, it's going to come forward. And it's usually not that critical if you're kind of somewhere in this range, unless, you know, let's say there's a cluster of balls over here or something that you're trying to break out. Then it's very important that you kind of look at the tangent lines and get them exactly perfect. Usually you're just trying to get a feel for the general direction it's going to go, uh, especially when you're playing a uh, kind of normal pattern. Uh, there's a bunch of drills. I have some on my website. There's a bunch of drills out there on the Internet. It's really important to be able to stop the ball from different distances. So one of the things I recommend doing is kind of a progressive drill. Uh, you can put the cue ball. Again, each of these diamonds on a 9-foot table is about 12 inches. So if I can put this about 2 feet away, uh, and I can practice and see if I can stop the ball from 2 feet away. Okay. So that was just a little bit below center. If I come 3 feet away, if I hit that same shot, the cue ball is going to roll forward. So I actually have to hit a little bit lower now. And what I recommend as a guideline, every one stroke is a little different, what I recommend as a guideline is you go down about a half a tip for every extra foot of distance. And you can maintain the same speed. You don't have to increase your speed. So I'm trying to hit these at a nice, you know, normal speed. So instead of going about, you know, a little bit below center, I'm going to go a full half tip below center now. So I'm going to line up center and go down a half a tip. Man, talking too much. Okay. So center, down a half a tip. Okay. So now I'm going to go back another foot. Be all the way back here. This would be a pretty pretty good distance shot in a normal game um, and this would be about four feet slightly more because of the angle so now I'm gonna have to go a full tip below center so I'm gonna start in the center and I wouldn't do this in a game I'm just kind of demonstrating it this way I'm gonna start in the center go down a half tip and go down another half tip. So now I'm a full tip below center Okay, so the ball stopped. And again, that's just kind of a guideline when you're playing any game. When you're learning, it's okay to do that. That's kind of how I learned back in the day is being very mechanical about it. But when you're playing in a game, over time, you kind of build up a good kind of a mental visual computer of how to hit these shots, and you just kind of feel like where you need to be on the ball. 
So let's go ahead and try one from five, uh, from five diamonds away. So this would be about the maximum that you can hit at that same speed with, without increasing the speed. So again, I try to kind of hit all my shots at the same speed if I can. Obviously different angles and positions. Sometimes you have to hit softer or harder, but I try to keep that same kind of reference speed going. So from here now, I'm going to be using maximum draw. So I'm going to go half tip, another half tip, one and a half tips, all the way down to the bottom of the ball and try to hit that same, uh, that same speed. So I'll start in the center, go one half, another half, and all the way down to the bottom. Okay. So it's really important to be able to do that kind of on command and, and I find that that's probably one of the biggest things that other than having good fundamentals it's one of the biggest things I think that beginning and intermediate level pool players can practice is stop shots and, and practice really feeling that speed um, and again there's some progressive practice drills that Bob Jewett has I have a link to those on my website if you don't spend the time kind of doing that separate from just playing it's going to be that feel. Um, you know, if I'm in a game and I have, you know, a shot like this, and, uh, you know, the eight ball is here, obviously I can hit this ball. It can go forward just a little bit or backward just a little bit, and I'm still going to have good shape on the eight. But I need to have a pretty good feel for at least getting it pretty pretty darn close to that spot I don't want to go forward a foot and scratch which I see people do all the time I don't want to accidentally put the draw draw on the ball and end up back. Um, so again I, I won't mechanically do it this time and visually I just kind of see where the ball is and I'm gonna get down to where it feels right for the speed I'm gonna use and so I cut the ball a little to the right and the cue ball went down the tangent line just a hair because I wasn't exactly straight in but I was able to hit that nice soft speed and keep the cue ball in that same vicinity and not not worry about that it was going to move too far so the tangent line is also very important I'll, I'll come and do it this way so without using any spinner this if I want to know where the cue ball is going to go after I hit it, again, I can line up kind of a ghost ball or visualize this. And I can look right down this tangent line and move it over to where the cue ball is going to be. And I can see that if I hit it right, the cue ball is going to come into there. So if it comes in at this angle, it's going to basically come out at that same angle, kind of forming a V. So if it's here, it should go roughly up here, so roughly over to this area of the table. And that's with no spin. A lot of people automatically put right English on this because they want the ball to go to the right. That's completely unnecessary. And it makes the shot a lot more try to put right or left English on the ball because there's a lot of compensations you have to do for that and we'll talk about that in a little bit so again I'm about foot and a half away from the ball so I'm gonna hit this at that same smooth speed and and probably just about a quarter tip below center and if I do it right uh, the ball should land pretty close to that chalk and come pretty close over to this chalk Okay, so picked up a little English off the rail, but, and I may have had my V even wrong, but you could see it hit right around that chalk and came up here. I didn't have to use any English on the shot. I didn't have to hit it hard. Just naturally let the cue ball go where it, where it wants to go. And, and really that's the best way to try to play position if you can. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about that uh, next clinic. But if you can see where the tangent line is, it's really, it's a really good starting point for trying to figure out how where the cue ball is going to go and how to play your patterns any questions on 
the stop shot or how to execute one. So the question was whether the li the tangent line is between the two balls or through the ghost ball, and kind of I know it's hard to tell when you're you know not <laughs> right up here, but yeah, it's it's it would technically be the line that the ghost ball sits on, but at that 90 degree angle. So basically, look at the tangent line and kind of shift it over about an inch, because you and that's a very good question because you want to be pool is a very precise game. Oh, it, again, when I play nine ball, for instance, which I play the most, or even eight ball to some extent. Um, you know, if I have a ball here, and my next shot is right here, and let's say the cue ball is here, I can get up near this 10 ball a bunch of Some people prefer to hit this just kind of center ball, and the ball will drift up this way, and they'll take an angle on the shot. Uh, some people would put a little inside English on this and kind of get a little closer to the ball. Uh, a lot of players will come two rails this way and come into the ball that way, which is m probably my preference. And I don't need to be, like ideally, I'd like to be, you know, maybe there, especially if I had to play position on another ball. If it's the last ball of the game, then I'd like to be probably right about there. But I don't have to be exactly there. Uh, and again, we'll talk about this a lot more next next class, but it's kind of a kind of a triangle kind of a zone I'm trying to get in. I don't want to be too far away because it makes a shot harder and I don't want to have a crazy angle because it makes a shot harder. So I, I really just want like a 5 to 15 degree angle and be 2 to 3 feet away. So when I hit this ball I don't need to execute a perfect stop shot or a perfect spin shot but it needs to be pretty darn close. And again through repetition um, you know you're just going to get in that area pretty often because you do drills like that and you practice things and where you just get the speed and the spin and everything and you don't really think about it too much so if I'm right here on this shot that's perfect I've got about a 10 to 15 degree angle I'm two or three feet away now I can pretty much do anything I want with the cue ball to get on the next shot in the sequence any other questions on the tangent line or the stop shot. I really I really encourage you guys and everyone watching to to practice them. Um, one of my favorite drills is kind of, I'll just line up three or four balls, or, but one of my favorite drills is to line up 15 balls across the middle of the table. Still even do this because I, I think it's important to work on your stroke. I already missed like two balls just not paying attention and they were easy shots and in a game I would hope I wouldn't do that but uh, you, we've all seen pros miss the simplest shots just a little blip in concentration and they don't really have that problem like our us casual players do but it still happens so and any little any little flaws back here or whatever it, it's it's easy so I, I, for a beginning player I would recommend that you put the ball maybe a foot away and then if you're intermediate, maybe a foot and a half away. Uh, and if you have a pretty decent stroke, you can just start from about two feet away. And, and again, line all the balls up all the way across and start with ball in hand and just try to shoot a perfect stop shot. Now what I usually see people do is this. I tell them, let's shoot perfect stop shots. And they get up like this, and they take their little warm-up strokes, and it looks kind of like that. Ball stopped. Ball went in but you can't sustain shooting at that speed in a pool game and, and be, uh, you just, you can't, I'm trying to think of the word, I just lost it. Um, you can't be successful as a pool player shooting at that speed. You just can't. Um, even the pros, when you come on YouTube, uh, every once in a while they're rifling balls in a little bit because they're in stroke and usually seen them at the end of a tournament where they've already played five or six matches. They're in dead stroke. They're ready to go. They might give it a little extra pop. Thorsten was just in town this week. He, uh, I don't think he can make it today because he had a race or something this morning, but Thorsten Holman, he used to be number one in the world. He's you know probably still in the top 15 or 20. Great pool player, perfect fundamentals. You watch him play, he just eases that cube table. There's no jabbing or slamming the ball or anything it's just super smooth stroke and the reason it sounds like he's hitting it so hard is because everything hits the back of the pocket 
And so it has that nice sound to it, and it makes you feel like he's hitting it harder than he is. But when you see it in person, it's super smooth, and it actually makes you realize how like bad your own game is when you're <laughs> when you're playing with them or watching them. So again, try to develop like a nice reference stroke on a scale of one to ten. I like to think myself that I'm shooting like at a three or a four. So again, kind of go through the routine, be just a little bit below center, and then. That's how I would shoot that ball in a match. I, I don't need to shoot it any harder unless I need to make the cue ball go somewhere. So, you know, take ball in hand, practice it, and, and stay down and watch what happens. If I hit this with a little bit of forward spin, the ball's going to go forward. If I hit it with a little draw, it's going to come back. If I hit it with left or right English, I'm going to see the cue ball spinning one way or the other. And if I miss aim the ball, I'm going to see the four ball entering the right or left side of the pocket, or I might miss the, in, you know, miss it completely. And... So it's really good to to kind of uh, analyze what you're doing wrong. Got one move just a hair. Not too disappointed with that, but again, if we're looking for perfection, you want it to stop completely dead. So I've had people, intermediate level players, pretty decent players, like five, six in APA, do this and they get real disappointed when they only make 10 or 11 or 12 out of 15 balls. Well. That, that's kind of the point. You're not going to make 15 out of 15 if you're a 5 or a 6 in APA. You're going to twist your wrist or jump up or do something and miss a couple balls. Um, I usually, I'll make 15 a lot of the time, but there's times I make 14 and there's times I even only make 13 because something just misfires in the brain and you're, you're dead straight and you come through and you just talk yourself out of it or twist or whatever, and that's the whole purpose of doing those kinds of drills. So one other thing you can do with this drill, actually a couple other things, but we'll start talking now about uh, follow and draw. So the tangent line's great, that 90 degree rule is great, but what if that's not where you want the cue ball to go? What if you want it to go somewhere else? So to put follow on the ball, it's pretty simple. You hit above center. And now if I hit above center, and I hit the ball super hard, I'm not going to get a ton of follow on the ball. I really, you really need to stroke it like you would a normal stop shot. So if I hit this ball, I'm going to go about halfway between the center and the top of the cue ball. And I'm just going to use the same stroke I used before for my stop shots. Okay. So nice and simple, nice and smooth, and the ball followed forward about four or five feet. There's no reason to elevate your cue. I see a lot of people, they, they, when they aim high, then this goes really high too. Um, you want your cue as level as possible. And really, a lot of times when you're hitting follow, you can hit a pretty nice smooth shot. You shouldn't, you shouldn't think about trying to swoop your cue up in the air or really whip your wrist through the ball or anything like that just make the same stroke you would if you were hitting a stop shot now there's certain little there's shots that are going to come up um, you know if i get stuck something like this my next shot is here and i have to uh kind of really juice up the ball well then yes i have to hit the ball a little firmer but i don't have to attack it and go crazy. So one thing I want you guys to see, and I don't know if it'll show up too well on the camera, but using the table is a good guideline to make sure that your stick is pretty level. Up with follow. I'm going to do what a lot of my students do like this. So you can see how high my stick is above the table. So if I go like this and I can't feel the table, I'm, I'm too high. When I line up, I'm here. And if I just drop my cue a little bit, I can feel that table. And you can see the tip goes even higher if I do that. Now, I don't want to be right on the table because it might damage the stick and damage my finger when I come through. But I want to be fairly close, maybe like an inch above the table at the most. So, again, pretty high on the cue ball. Nice level cue. Okay, so I didn't kill the ball, just stroke through it. And it followed forward, you see that nice little kind of revving action. It goes forward, and then it d uses the momentum to just carry up the table. That's about 
other than some little trick shots or some crazy situations you might be in, that's about the most you're ever going to really need uh, in a game. A lot of times, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You might have a shot like this. Your next ball might be there. And, you know, again, you look at, you look at this, the tangent line is pointing backwards. So you know if you hit a stop shot, it's coming here and it's coming over this way somewhere. So I, I need it to go forward. So I'm just going to go a little above center. Okay, so again, nice and easy. And, and just you think about where that tangent line is. And if the tangent line is pointing this way, when I hit follow, it's going to come in here like this, and it's going to go forward of the tangent line, and then it's going to go that way. One thing to talk about. Hello. Hey. One of the questions I get, and there's tons of information about this in books and some of the videos online, is if I hit follow, where's the cue ball going to go? There's some 30 degree rules, there's some other things, but what basically happens if I hit a follow stroke, so I'm coming at the ball, here's my tangent line going like this, what's going to happen is when I hit follow, the cue ball is going to go down the tangent line. It's going to go down the tangent line for some amount of time. How much it goes down is going to depend on how hard I hit the ball. So if I hit the ball very easy, it's going to follow the tangent line maybe just for like an inch or so, and then it's going to want to start to bend forward because of the follow. If I hit it really hard, it's going to stay down that tangent line, and then as the revolutions kind of kick in, it's going to follow forward. So technically, if I have a shot like this, I could hit the rail anywhere from about here to about here based on how much follow I use and what, what speeds I use. So I'll kind of show you, like, kind of mark the balls real quick. So if I hit this really soft, pretty high, but soft. Okay, so you can see I hit down there. Okay, so now I'm going to hit it medium speed. So you can see it hit way up here on the on the rail. And if I hit it really hard, it may not even have that much time to start going forward because it'll actually kind of usually jump off the ball a little bit. Okay, so typically when you hit a ball really hard, it's hard to really keep your cue perfectly level. So a lot of times when you hit a ball hard, it, it, it hops. And you can use that to your advantage sometimes when you're playing position. But a lot of times you don't want it to do that. You want to try to keep it nice and smooth. So what's interesting about playing position and using spin is if, if that's my pretty simple shot, not much angle, but my tangent line is way up here, and then I can hit any of these spots on the rail just by using follow. No side spin, no anything, just speed and different amounts of follow. Um, one of the things you can practice, it's a little more advanced, I wouldn't recommend like a beginning player has to worry about this so much, but again for position concepts, if I'm two feet away like this, as an example, one of the things that uh, some of the players out there are really big on is, it's called a replacement shot. So it's basically I want to hit, instead of a stop shot, I want to hit the ball and I want about two inches and take the place of the six ball. And it seems like that may not be important because if I can stop it or go forward two inches, what's the difference? But if you can get a replacement shot perfectly, that mimics the action of what's called a stun follow, which is kind of in between a stop shot and a follow shot. And again, that's how you end up accessing these different areas of the rail without having to use um, side spin. It's basically just speed and different amounts of spin. So. If you think about this, if I, if for me to hit a stop shot from here at the speed I was using, 
I have to hit like a quarter tip below center. So for me to hit a replacement shot, I just go a little higher. So I'll just hit this exactly at center ball. And we should see that it goes forward uh, about two inches. Okay. So again, being able to repeat that, you have to be able to do that to reach kind of an advanced level. Um, because you have to be able to access those parts of the rail in between the true stop shot and the true follow shot. And there's a similar concept with draw. I'll just mention it now, but it's some people call it a stun draw or, or kind of a mini draw, and it's the same kind of thing. Again, if my stop shot my stop shot is a quarter tip below center and I want that ball to come back two inches, I need to go just a hair down below. So here's my stop shot position. I'm just going to go just a little bit below. And that way I can control just getting that ball to come back, you know, a couple of inches. Any questions on follow? Most people are pretty good at follow, even the people that aren't doing it correctly. You always see the bar players, they, they have the break and their cue goes like this and the ball hits the rack and bounces back and has all this follow on it and they did it accidentally and they, they don't even know really what they did or why they did it, um, but they can do it. Uh, draw for some reason, kind of, it's the same exact concept but it gets in people's head, they, they, they're, they're afraid of, of jumping the ball, they're afraid of not getting the draw so they try harder to get the draw and then they get less draw and it's just like a big, it's just a big uh, catastrophe sometimes. <laughs> So it's kind of nice. I've had, I can't even count, dozens of students over the years that have had problems drawing the ball. And sometimes it takes 30 minutes, 40 minutes to get the person, like they're angst about hitting it. And, but once they, once they get it and once they see the action, it, it, it's like it just turns a light bulb on and then they realize how they need to hit the ball and it's just like easy after that. And of course it requires some practice and all of that, but, um, a lot of it's just about trusting the physics behind it. So with follow, it's a little less important how high you are on the cue ball. You don't, you definitely don't want to be just a little above center unless you're just trying to travel just a little bit. Um, but generally, if you're about halfway between the top of the ball and the middle of the ball, you get like a nice true roll on the ball. Uh, for some of the trick shot type follow shots you see, you have to use more, I guess, what's called prograde topspin, so you want to be really high on the ball. Uh, again, level Q, and, and you'll see your tip is as high on the ball as it would be for low for a draw shot, which scares some people. Uh, a lot of people I work with, when they're hitting a follow shot and their tip is way up here, they feel like they're going to go right over the ball, but it's the bottom part of your tip that's hitting the cue ball, not, not the part you're looking at. So it looks like you're really high, but in reality, you're than what you what you're seeing so for draw uh, I'll use a stripe ball too just to show it a little better even though the meals kind of rotate pretty well too so for draw again there's nothing nothing uh, magical about this there's no special technique there's no flipping of the wrist at the exact perfect moment there's no up and down of the arm none of this crazy stuff I've heard uh, I've had a number of people come to me that have taken lessons from other people that tell me that somebody told them to elevate their cue to get draw. That's like the worst advice ever. bridge by squeezing my fingers together so the bridge comes up and I kind of lower my butt just a little bit so it's a little bit like a seesaw so again if I'm hitting draw as I flatten my hand out this may come up just a little bit as well I don't want that I, I want it just a hair and it's just kind of a natural movement to feel that so again I'm gonna go down just about um, a little more than a half a tip and just hit it nice and smooth. 
Okay, so that was just like three quarters of a tip of draw, nice smooth stroke, pretty close to the ball, but drew the ball back, you know, six or seven feet. It it doesn't require a Mike Massey or a Venom, you know, trick to be able to do that kind of thing in a game. Uh, it does matter a little that your tip, it doesn't have to be a, a certain specific tip. I have people hand me cues sometimes, they're like, I can't get draw with this cue, and I think I mentioned this in previous clinics. I had one guy that he was right. I couldn't get draw with his cue either. But but generally, um, it's not the cue or the tip. Um, but you do want to have a nice, decent shape on the tip. You do want it to be, it can't be rock hard like a break tip, even though you can kind of get draw with that too. Uh, and it just has to be well chalked. Otherwise, it's a lot more about just technique. So again, as distance increases, that draw spin is going to wear off and so that's why a lot of amateurs they can draw the ball when they're a foot or two away but they start to get three or four feet away you don't often have to draw the ball a lot when you're that far away but it's almost impossible for them to get a draw stroke because when they hit it it's just they're not getting enough quality draw on the ball and so as it comes down it's just wearing off and then it starts to go forward again so again when I hit these I try to be nice and low on the ball and I, I mess them up sometimes too. I'll, I'll, in anticipation of trying to get the draw, and possibly people watching or some momentous moment in a in a match. I mean, I've had shots like this, pretty difficult, and I've hit them in practice uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of times, and it's not a big deal. But if it's six six and you're playing to seven, and all of a sudden you gotta like come with that shot, it's real easy to come through, and all of a sudden you're tighten your wrist or you do one of these or whatever so but realistically when you're about here um, a lot of times I'm really not trying to draw the ball all the way back to the end of the table I might just want to draw it back a foot or two but I still need to put a good quality stroke on it to keep the draw on the ball all the way there so again this would not be a three or four speed I'm probably gonna have to hit this at like a five or a six speed in order to keep the draw on the ball and you can see where the stripe is. This is a good way to practice, by the way. Instead of using the measle ball or a cue ball with no markings on it, put a stripe ball down. Takes a couple extra seconds, but put it down. You can use a training ball too, and um, use that use that horizontal stripe as a reference as to how high or low you are on the ball. Uh, you can also use like a lighter colored stripe, and this is what I usually use. Chalk up your cue really good. Typically, when you're done hitting the draw shot, you'll see a chalk mark on the on the ball, and so you can see exactly where you hit on the ball. So you can see I'm down. Top of my tip is pretty much at at the stripe. Okay. So again, I didn't kill that. It's not like trick shot speed or anything crazy, but I did have to come through it just a little bit more acceleration than I would on my normal shot but by staying low and staying relaxed ball will do what I want it to do and uh, I think I did this one other time but if you guys can see the chalk mark is pretty low on the ball and again the, the top the top part of my tip is what's hitting the ball so I should have a good quality chalk mark like right near the stripe just a little bit above the stripe I know you know what it looks like but so it's just like a little bit above the stripe Verified. I've got <laughs> Mark has verified from the uh, office of Price Waterhouse Coopers that the <laughs> mark is just above the stripe. I know you've seen that before, so you can see it's like just a little bit above the stripe. I believe you. Okay. <laughs> now, if I was going to shoot a trick shot type draw or, or like a Mike Massey, one of those guys are doing that kind of thing, the chalk mark would actually be probably right on the border of the stripe and the and the white part of the ball. And they're basically hitting at the extreme like miscue limit of, of the ball as the ball starts to curve and the, the tip's just about to slip off it. Um, they're just really good at hitting through practice and their strokes are really good. Um, that's one thing I, you know, I want to mention just real quick. Like when you're, I, I've had people ask me or I've seen people ask professional players, oh, your stroke is so good or you get so much spin on the ball or whatever. 
There is nothing, absolutely nothing magical about it. It's not like playing tennis or golf where you have to be a six foot four, you know, big guy or have Tiger Woods perfect timing to hit a ball 300 yards. Anybody can hit that same shot I just hit very easily. It doesn't require strength. It doesn't require anything special. It's acceleration through the cue ball and hitting the ball low, and that's it. There's no, there's no magic sauce to it. Um, anybody that I've worked with that cannot draw the ball, when I see their chalk mark, it's halfway up the ball. They're aiming nice and low, everything looks good, and they're either dropping their shoulder, they're lifting their head up, they're really throwing their elbow down, they're doing something to alter that tip location. The other thing I've seen, especially with some of the, I don't know, I've had some people I've worked with that just don't have a real powerful stroke, and what I see is they, they actually hit the ball nice and low, the chalk mark looks really good, but when I set them up with something like this, their stroke kind of looks like this, so they'll be nice and low, and then they'll be like that. Well, there's just there's no acceleration to the stroke. It, the ball just died. I mean, it had some spin. It looked good, and then it just stops. So usually what I'll do, and if you're one of those people watching, uh, what I like to do is I, I like to get their speed up. I like to get them, you know, just learning to, to move the cue a little faster. So I'll have them take a couple of balls, and we'll just work on hitting the ball into the pocket. And so they'll just kind of, usually they'll do something like that. And I'm like, no, you need to, like, you need to accelerate through. And so then we get it up to where it's, you know, like that. And I'm like, okay, if you hit the ball like that, as low as you just hit it, you're going to get some draw. You know, and then I try to get them to where they can just, you know, just hit the ball and try to, that was even a horrible stroke on my part because I'm talking. But, you know, you want to be able to do it. You know, where your tip doesn't fly up in the air or anything like that, just that that's that's more than enough speed in conjunction with different tip positions for you to be able to move the cue ball anywhere you need to around the table. Um, I mentioned it before with follow, how the ball goes down the tangent line and then curves forward. With draw, I think it's a little more even... Uh, more noticeable when that happens. People love that curving action of a draw shot. Um, and again, nothing magical about that. Uh, we certainly use that to our advantage. Um, and I'll shoot it in this direction. So again, if I have a if I have a slight angle like this, and if I need the ball to be back up here and I couldn't go forward, let's say, to do it, all I need to do is put a nice quality draw on the, str draw stroke on the, on the shot, and it's going to follow the tangent line, which is actually going away from the shot, but at some point, it's going to bend backwards, and then if I put a little left English on it, it's actually going to open up the angle, and it'll come right up here. And again, I don't need to hit this hard, just need to hit it smooth, so I give it time to bend. Okay, so when it hit, it bent backwards, and then the spin opened up the angle even more. So I can really alter the path of the cue ball by using different speeds and different spins without having to hit the ball super, super hard. Yep. There's not but really so. They talk about a five yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll cover that. So the question was, on follow, uh, we can kind of figure out where the ball is going to go, but when we're drawing the ball, like where is it going to go behind the tangent line? So a lot of that's feel and experience uh, through repetition. There is, uh, and you mentioned, there is a trisect or bisect type system that Dr. Dave talks about, and it's on his website, and it's a good guideline. But again, it's going to be very dependent on the amount of draw you use and the amount of um, a speed you're hitting at. So let's just say I have a shot like this, and my cue ball's here. So the system that he talks about is basically if I, if I hit this ball at this angle, and I have to kind of visualize what that angle is, that the cue ball is going to return uh, twice as far. 
and again that's it's that trisect system right so here's a third of the angle and then here's another third here's another third so if I can visualize here straight in or here straight where this ball is so my angle is like that so it looks I'm trying to visualize that little that little pie shaped triangle so if I come another little bit and then another little bit his system would say that you're estimating to hit the ball about right here now again that's gonna if I whack it it's gonna go down this tangent line and it's not gonna curve until way down here I, I I probably could pretty easily scratch here let me mark these balls Oh, that one's already marked so if I hit this with kind of a little bit of a power draw stroke so you can see I can get it to come pretty far down without even hitting it very hard and if I hit it a little harder you know I can really hit all these different parts on the rail but for his system and I guess the kind of the guideline I use it would require kind of a, a smoother draw stroke so let's try to hit it kind of right into the pocket okay so it's again it's a guideline it gets pretty close and I could have hit that ball a little more to the middle of the pocket and then it would have came a little more this way and probably would have been right at the chalk so um, there's kind of a wagon wheel drill I've showed before and I'll probably cover that a little bit in the position stuff but um, it, it's a good again it's a guideline there, there's no substitute for practicing a bunch sure <laughs> Yeah, I wish I had like magical lines I could impose while I'm doing this, but that would be like how Tor and some of those guys do on their DVDs when they edit it. So, um, so again, I'm visualizing my angle to where I need to hit to make the ball versus where I am like straight at the ball, right? So if I'm straight here and I have to hit here, I, I basically have like a little, I'm visualizing like kind of a little triangle kind of like an angle right like almost like you have a protractor or something so here's where I need to hit straight into the pocket and then that would be my angle over the center of the cue ball right so there's the path to the pocket there's my angle so if I look at that I'm about it's about a little more than the width of a cue ball away so if I just kind of picture those angles and I go another two or three inches and then another two or three inches that would get me roughly to about there so whatever my angle is I want to double it so it's kind of a three-part thing and again so if I look at that and hit that kind of toward the middle of the pocket broke it'll you know again that one was a little more of a stun stroke I didn't really draw it and that's what I said this is always ever gonna it's it's never gonna be more than a guideline but again, if you practice a certain speed and you practice a certain amount of spin, you can be pretty accurate with that. Exactly. So like, exactly. Yeah. So like Jeremy said, you have a lot of leeway, especially when the ball is close to a pocket. You can hit it in the right side of the pocket, the middle of the pocket, left side of the pocket. That changes the angle, which then triples the angle, and then you can hit a, a wide variety of spots. If you yeah, so the question is if you if you hit the right side of the pocket, your angle's based on that. Yes, if you plan to hit it there and you actually hit it there, of course. So if you plan to hit the right side of the pocket and then you hit the left side of the pocket, you're, you know, yeah. So again, I I, I learned that system a long long time ago. Um, I, before I, whoever came up with it, Dr. Dave published it and and did a nice write up on it. Um, but um, again, it's it's a guideline. One other thing, quickly, I want to talk about on replacement shots that I forgot before, and I, I think it's important, is it's not always that big of a deal if you can hit a ball kind of firm and get it to go forward two inches, or you can hit a ball soft and have it go forward like kind of two inches. But when you have distance, something like this, say I have just a little bit of angle on this shot, and I'm playing on a crappy table 
and my next shot is like here. So I don't really necessarily want to slow roll this ball, uh, especially on like again a bar table or a, a table that's got any kind of inconsistency on it. Number one, when you slow roll a ball, y all your kind of small twitch muscles come into play and if you're a little bit nervous or any of that it's very likely you'll end up making a poor stroke uh, I that's why you see a lot of guys when they get nervous they hit the ball harder and harder and harder because they're trying to overcome so on this table nice quality professional table I would have I wouldn't mind even there like I, I miss hit the ball a little and I wouldn't mind hitting it because I think it would stay online but it's a much cleaner way to do it is to kind of hit the replacement shot so again I'd have to visualize this you have to practice this but if I'm this far away I want to be able to hit just above a stop shot so if I was to count and try to be real academic with this if I'm like one two three four five diamonds away and I know from the previous exercise I have to be way at the bottom of the ball so basically, maybe I'll just come up a half a tip from the bottom of the ball and make that same stroke. Again, I don't have to hit this hard. I just have to feel the amount of spin and speed. So I'm going to go way down to the bottom of the ball, and I'm going to come up just a little bit. Okay, so you see how it stopped? It rolled forward just a little. If I needed to roll forward more, I just come up a little higher on the ball. So maybe now I'm going to have to hit this shot, and I'm just going to go a half tip below center and try to keep that same speed. Okay. So I hit that ball pretty firm to keep any inconsistencies out of the way, but because I just want a half tip below center instead of all the way down, it rolled backward, it slid, and then it started rolling forward, and it was essentially mimicking the same thing as if I was nice and close to the ball and you know I did something like that it's essentially giving it that same sort of action because of the amount of follow on it so again it's a really good use for the replacement shot and, and a really good reason to practice them okay I want to see how much time I have to talk okay I got a little bit of time yet so this is a topic I could probably talk about for three or four hours very easily. I will, yeah. On the, re on the replacement shot, at what angle does it no longer, when does it start to not work? Well, it always works. Well, so the question is, when does the replacement shot not work? If you're straight in, yeah. it, it's, again, if you have your tip position and speed right, that it'll work. But even if you're at an angle, again with the right speed and tip position it's going to follow a line in between the tangent line and the pure follow line Understood. yeah okay yeah a lot of people just to add to that a lot of people don't a lot of people don't consciously hit replacement shots they don't even think about hitting replacement shots it sort of sometimes happens. Maybe you just do it and you don't even know why you're doing it or how you're doing it. Um, draw shots are the same way. If I have a shot like this, right, if I'm like here and I've got a, almost a straight in angle to the pocket, if I hit a draw shot, it's going to hit, it's going to follow a little bit, it's going to come back this way. I'm going to be coming back toward this side of the table. But what if I need to come up that way? And if I hit a stop shot, stun shot, the ball is going to go this way. And and maybe there's a ball there. You know, maybe we're playing eight ball or something, and you know there's some stripes over here. So I can't follow that tangent line to get shape. And I don't want to draw the ball because if I overdraw it, it's going to come back over here. So again, I can hit like a stun follow. So it's in between a draw shot and a stun shot and it just requires feel and, and experience to be able to access that angle but again if I'm about two feet away my stun shot would be like a little bit below center so if I just go a little bit more below center but not 
far enough to where I get a draw, it should come sort of that way. So we'll see what happens. That was my stun. This was my draw line. I went in between. So again, whether you kind of just feel that, because you've got a lot of experience, you hit 10,000 balls and you just kind of see it and feel it, or you put in the repetitive practice needed to kind of develop those skills and you're consciously thinking about it and spending time over the balls, that, that's what I recommend. That's what I did when I was younger. Um, it just gives you more options. So let's talk, talk a little bit about magical spin shots. Um, everybody wants to ball and juice it and do all kinds of crazy things. Um, I was one of them when I was younger. I certainly am not afraid of using spin. I, I'll do, I'll do anything I need to. I try not to use a lot of spin when I'm at distance because even then, unless you're playing eight hours a day, it's kind of hard to feel all that. But if I'm this close to the ball, I feel pretty comfortable doing just about anything I want. Um, the key thing with side spin is it does not take effect until you hit a rail. I see a ton of people. They have a shot like this, and they want the ball to go to the left. So they automatically just line the shot up with some sort of left English. And it doesn't matter if they need the left English or not. They're just, they, in their mind, they're cutting the ball to the right, so they put a little left English on the ball. Now, there is a system like that. There are some pros that like to use this helping English, and they're always putting a little bit of opposite English on the ball. And that's okay if it's a little bit and if you're prepared to completely compensate for that every single time you hit a ball. Um, if I had to hit a shot, doesn't matter what the shot is, if I had to hit a shot like this and someone said, oh, hey, I'll give you $1,000 if you make that ball, I am not hitting it with left English, I'm not hitting it with right English, and I'm not going to draw the ball. I'm going to hit it with a nice, smooth, rolling ball, and I'm going to give it every opportunity to, to just roll naturally in the hole. I, I need to account a little bit for the collision-induced throw, which I talked about a little bit last time, but I don't need to use a ton of English to be able to make that ball. Uh, decelerating on the stroke, hitting it too hard, even with a low deflection shaft, it's it's going to move, it's going to do something. So, just to demonstrate real quick, hopefully I can do this, um, and I've done this in the past, in case anybody doubts that the English doesn't do anything. Get a nice stop shot with English. Okay, so I just put like a full tip of right English on that ball. It is not going anywhere until it hits a rail. If it has all that spin on it and it hits a rail, then it opens up the angle. And if it has the other spin on it and it hits a rail, then it sp spins in that direction. But until it hits a rail, it's not going to do anything. So that's the first concept, which should be obvious, but I see people still doing it all the time. Second thing is there's about four things that happen when you hit a ball with spin. And you have to consciously or subconsciously correct for all four of those things. Uh, one of them is not that big of a deal, but they all happen. So the first thing is deflection. That's probably the biggest one. The low deflection shafts have managed to compensate for that quite a bit, but it is a real effect. If you ever see anybody say uh, they got this brand new shaft and it's zero deflection, that's not true. Um, I'll talk about some techniques to compensate for spin, and it can make you feel like the stick doesn't have any deflection or it's super, super low, but it's still going to have some. So one way to test this, if you have a stick, you can put a ball like right in the middle of the rail. Um, and I try to aim directly at that ball. And rather than angle my stick or do anything fancy, I'm just going to basically use like what a lot of people do, which is called parallel English. So I'm going to aim at the ball and kind of move my stick over, and I'm going to shoot right down that line. So if there was no deflection in the cue, it would go the direction I'm aiming, and it would hit that ball full in the face. So I'm going to aim right at it. I'm going to parallel over. Okay. So I hit about half of that ball, which means I got about an inch of deflection over seven feet of distance. That means when I have this shot, and we all see people do it, and they're way back here, and they try to hit this shot with high right English, 
because they want to make it and go one, two, three, and come all the way back up here for position, that is a very difficult shot. I have to aim, if that's my aim point right there, I have to aim right there and hope that I use the exact same speed and the same spin I just did so the cue ball actually hits exactly an inch away to make that ball and then still have enough speed on it to spin it all the right way around the table. Now if I'm here, the shot's much easier because deflection, if you think about it, is kind of like a V. It's a, you have a certain amount of deflection regardless of, of uh, the amount, you know, a little bit of more spin will make a difference and speed will make a difference, but it's a V. So if I'm close to the ball, I'm not going to have an inch of deflection. It might only be a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch. So it's easier to compensate when I'm close. Um, having a shot like this, even if I juice it up, Ooh, hit that really bad. Huh. And that proves my point, actually. I'm glad I did that. So I'm going to... Okay. So you can see, you didn't really pay attention the first time. I mean, I missed it by, I don't know, two, three, four inches. Because it completely deflected. And again, I'll, I'll shoot the shot from up here because I've done it enough. But it it's, doesn't make me happy. I don't want to do it. <laughs> kind of get out of the way and it doesn't push the ball quite as much. If I use, oh, this one right here. So I'm going to as the lower deflection shots or uh, shafts. <coughs> no, thanks. So the second thing that you have to account for is, is curve or swerve. So it's kind of hard to see unless you're doing a mass A shot, you know, where you see, where you can clearly see when you elevate that the ball goes down and then curves. But that happens to some degree on, on regular shots too. So let's just say I hit a bunch of right English on this shot. The cue ball is going to deflect to the left, and then it's going to swerve back to the right a little bit. Um, the slower I hit it, the more it's going to swerve. The more distance I have, the more it's going to have time to swerve. Um, so again, there's no perfect mathematical formula where you're going to, I suppose you could program a computer or something maybe, or a robot to be able to do it perfectly. But when we're playing, it becomes sort of a feel exercise. You have to hit enough of these shots over and over and over again to learn at what speed and what distances you have to, how much you have to compensate for. The third thing that happens when you use spin is you get um, some collision-induced throw. So, and also spin-induced throw. So when I, when I hit the ball, as it cuts across, it's going to twist the ball a little bit and if I have some right spin on the cue ball, it's going to transfer just a little bit of left spin to the object ball, like 2 or 3%, and it's going to throw it just slightly. Now, personally, when I'm playing, unless I'm hitting the ball very, very soft, I don't worry about the throw aspect. It, it really doesn't throw it enough to, to make a difference. The really important factors to pay attention to are the deflection and the swerve. And really, if you put those things together, what I think about is n like net deflection, is how much is it going to move off of my aim line. There's different ways to compensate for using spin. Um, a, a really easy and, and clean and good technique, it's, it's not going to be perfect, but let's just say I'm hitting this ball with some inside English, some right English. I know it's going to deflect to the left. 
and it's probably going to deflect more than it's going to curve. So my net deflection is going to be a little bit to the, it's going to move a little to the left. So if I know it's going to move to the left, that means I have to hit this ball a little fuller. If I aim right here where I need to, I'm actually going to hit a little to the left, and it's going to send this ball right down there. So if I aim this, I'm going to aim right where I need to. Okay, so it, it went a good couple inches to the right of the pocket. And again, you see league players all the time when they have to use some inside English, especially um, miss the ball pretty significantly because they're not taking that into account. So one simple way to think about this is just aim the ball a little fuller. Uh, sometimes people will just aim it to the left side of the pocket. And if you're going to think you're going to get a little more deflection, just aim it like at the point of the pocket. Uh, if you're going to get a lot of deflection, you may have to aim it even an inch above the pocket. So on a shot like this, I'm going to do the same thing with parallel English. I'm going to aim right at the point of the pocket. So if I shot this straight and with no deflection, I would miss the ball. Okay, even that one went in a little bit to the right side of the pocket. So it still moved a good probably inch and a half. Now, a couple things you can do to minimize deflection is shoot at a smooth speed and try to get close to your object ball. So if I'm, if I'm here and I need to use some inside, some left English to spin the ball up, up to this part of the table, if I'm close and I shoot smooth with a low deflection shaft, I really don't have to adjust all that much. So if I'm here, I'm aiming right where I need to be. Okay. Even that one, I, got, I guess I got a little bit on. I was a little smoother. So you can see I hit that nice and soft, and it didn't really deflect that much. Well, it deflected, but it also swerved back a little bit, so they kind of canceled out. If I angle my stick a little, so instead of aiming parallel, which I, I don't ever do, and you can see why, like it's, to me it's inconsistent. That's how I grew up playing. It's almost, I don't think anybody really does that anymore um, at, at, a, at a top like pro level. So typically what we're going to do instead is if you think about it, you can do it very manually, automatically. But I want to aim my shot just like I normally would, and I'm going to basically just swivel my tip over. It's called backhand English. I basically just want to like angle my stick a little. So that means it's going to go away from my body a little, or I might pull it into my body a little bit if I'm angling to the right. So what that allows me to do is aim exactly where I want to, angle over a little bit, Oh, man, that was me. That had nothing to do with the... Okay. So I, I could aim right where I wanted to and just kind of turn the stick over. And, and once you find your proper bridge distance and everything, you can, you can use that from a lot of different situations. So again, I'm going to be right, right where I need to just going to come over a little bit, about a half a tip. And so some people, what they like to do, they like to take all their practice strokes down the normal line and then move the tip over and then just shoot down that line. Some people like to line up and then shift their tip over, over and then take all their practice strokes down like that new line. Uh, some people like to kind of fidget their body a little and realign their body to that new line of aim because they don't like that feeling of shooting like across their body. Um, all three are really okay. The end goal and the way most professionals, I think, do it. Uh, I have seen people make manual adjustments on certain shots, and I still do on some shots too. But really the end goal is to learn that when you land on the ball, you just land with your stick angled. So your eyes are looking at the shot line, and your stick is just angled a little. And when you land that way, your body can already be in the right position so you don't feel like you're, you know, shooting across. So if I was going to shoot this ball, so I just get down and my tip's already to the left. And then I don't have to make that manual, uh, that manual pivot. 
But when I'm teaching people or when I was practicing this, the, the manual method is a good way to prove it. One way, I'll shoot a couple balls. I'll shoot them kind of quick so that you can kind of see which ones work and which ones don't. But you have, you really have very little chance of successfully making a lot of spin shots if you can't shoot a straight in shot with spin. Because it's all about hitting the contact point with a compensation so that the ball hits where you think it's supposed to hit. So if you're just a couple feet away like this, one way you can practice your different techniques is to line up center ball, turn the stick to the, you know, let's say to the right or the left. Okay, so that ball went straight, but I got spin on it. So I feel that that distance for that speed and that kind of technique I use that that worked. And so what you do, what I used to do a lot, is you start to practice different speeds, different distances, different amounts of spin, and just get a feel for how much you need to compensate. So the, the question was about negating the collision-induced throw. Um, there's really no throw because it's a straight-in shot, but it negates the deflection and the swerve. Because basically what... Well, you get a very little bit about that, a little bit. I, I don't ever worry about spin-induced throw unless I'm hitting the ball really soft. When you hit it really soft, then it can throw the ball a little bit. But at that normal kind of playing speed, it, it's such a small amount. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, again, that was backhand English. Another technique is called fronthand English. And so that's basically where you actually move your bridge a little bit to the right or the left. So that would look like this. I would line up on the shot and I would roll my bridge to the right or roll my bridge to the left. And what that does is it effectively makes a, a different effective pivot point. Instead of pivoting the cue from here, you're kind of effectively pivoting it from a, a farther distance so you get a little more of an adjustment. Um, if anyone here, I know you probably already glazed over with all this, but if anyone's interested in the physics of all this, uh, I don't recommend trying to play this way because it would really get in your head, and I think we all shoot better when we're just using our subconscious. But Dr. Dave has an excellent write-up on his uh, page, and I think there's a lot more details in one of his new videos that came out where he actually uses the Revo himself, and so he's talking about the Revo specifically, and he did all this testing. So like at, at, at different distances, different speeds, different amounts of spin, he says, well, if I use 60% fronthand English and 40% backhand English, that's the perfect amount for this. You've seen that, yeah. Yeah, he's got a really nice chart. Now, again, I don't recommend anybody memorize that and try to sit there and calculate. And I, if anybody would do that, it would be me. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's, it, it is a good tool, though for practicing and for learning and seeing the effects of how it can be done um, and then having that kind of built into your internal computer so you just kind of understand how to do it. He does. Shoot, yeah. yeah, so Jeremy was saying he's got a, because they can't hear you, um, Jeremy was saying he's got a chart posted where you can actually download it, take it to the table and like practice it. And I tried a little bit of it. I mean, I've already done that kind of experimentation myself. I got my own little crazy spreadsheets that I didn't share with anybody because I don't have the vehicle that Dr. Dave does or didn't at the time. But uh, yeah, it's great. And I mean, it, it's really cool to see the science of the game starting to come back again a little bit. I, I read this book called The Science of Pocket Billiards probably back in, man, like late 80s, early 90s. And I, I haven't seen scientific stuff like that being published really since then except for back on the old like alt like rec.sport.billiard back in the old internet days when it first came on um so it's kind of nice now that there's forums online and there's people talking about it and in the same way that people talk about golf swing mechanics and and tennis mechanics and all that that we never really talked about years ago so again take it from me don't get too into it and let it get in your head too much but it's good knowledge to have and since I like to teach and like to analyze all that stuff it, it's fun yeah when, when you were shooting at your red corner pocket okay and you were putting spin on it your speed was uh, usually you shoot like a four or three or four 
you treated that like a tribe. It, it, was, it looked hard. Yeah, I, I think I hit that one a little. Uh, the question was about the speed using with the spin. If I'm like playing, concentrating, all that good stuff, I, I, a, again, I like to play for angles where I don't need a lot of spin. And so I should be just tweaking it a little bit here and there. And it should be almost, it feels to me almost automatic. So, you know, but that one I, I, I probably hit a little harder, yeah. And, and especially like trying to demonstrate it. So like here's a good example. So here's just a... And when I practice, I, I sometimes use like the whole reinforcers or I make these obnoxious marks on the table. But I really like to more shoot in categories. So if I'm practicing a shot, like if I look at a shot like this, I'm about two feet away. I'm about like a five degree angle. The next one might be a seven degree angle. The next one might be three feet away. I just try to prove like little techniques or whatever to myself by getting them in a, in a range of shots. So let's say I have a shot like this. Tangent line is way over here. The follow line is probably going to hit somewhere like this. So if I need to be over here on this rail, I'm going to have to put a little right English on the ball so that when it hits the rail, it turns to the right a little bit. So when I do this, for me, I just get down on the shot normally and have my stick cur uh, angled just a hair to the right, like an eighth of a tip. It's not very much at all. And then I can just make my normal 3-4 speed stroke and and let the spin kind of take care of itself. So I'm going to land just a little bit to the right. Man, not shooting good at all. Straighten out more. No, if I if anything like even that one, right? I hit that a little harder than I intended to. And I got a little bit of deflection that I wasn't planning for, and so I caught the outside edge of the pocket. And uh, so it's it's always good to try to hit them smooth if you can. Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me rephrase that. Yeah, yeah. Question. Okay. You were shooting that when you were putting English on it, okay? And based on your speed, you look it looks like you were hitting it like a, a five. You were you were hitting it harder than your normal stroke. Okay. And so I'm wondering uh, what he said, was, was hitting it hard or straighten it out? Or <laughs> no, so so the question was about hitting the ball harder. So like, uh, I guess if I hit the ball harder, it's because I need to make the cue ball m travel more, okay. ir irrespective of the spin. I'm not necessarily having to hit it harder to generate more spin it's because of the this distance I need the cue ball to travel. Okay. So like even on this shot, I'll try to stop talking while I'm shooting, but I'll talk before I shoot, that's probably better. Um, so like if I want to use a ton of spin on this ball, I can put a ton of spin on this, but hit it pretty soft. And, and it really won't do much because it's not gonna have enough speed to hit the rail. But just to kind of show you, okay. I don't even care about the shot, but just, you can see I got a good amount of side spin on the ball, but I didn't really hit it very hard, okay. but hmm. it's not going to do anything. So if I have a shot like this, let's say I have to get, let's say my next shot is like right there, and I have some balls blocking me so I can't just go up the table. If I had to use like inside English to get like over here, I kind of have to juice it up a little bit to get the speed and the spin on there. And so, and again, this would only be if I went that way. I wouldn't normally choose to do that. So for me to, to be able to do that. Like it, of course I hit the pocket. But you can see like I, you really have to hit it firm to move the cue ball. Yeah, no, so if I, so if I have this shot and again, I don't care how you compensate, whether it's front hand, back hand, yeah. swiping motion, whatever. If I hit that shot from this distance even at that speed, I'm going to aim subtly different than if I was hitting it at a smoother speed. Okay, so the question was if I make subtle adjustments to how much I move my back hand for the English. It's not so much about back hand movement or the front hand movement is going to control how, how many tips of spin you're putting on the ball, but 
the compensation for the English has to be done um, differently. So again, it could be, going back to like Dr. Dave's chart, it could be that if I hit the ball hard with a full tip of English, I need to use 50% front-hand English, 50% backhand English, and if I hit it soft, maybe I can use 80% backhand English. So it has to do with like how, how I'm angling the cue, and if I'm not using those techniques, then it has to do with where I'm aiming. So if that's my center line, if I'm using just a little bit of English, maybe I can aim just a little bit over here. And if I'm using a lot, maybe I have to almost aim outside the pocket to... Is any of that conversation translate to cue balls a lot further? Yeah, definitely. So if I'm farther away like this, <laughs> this becomes a much more difficult shot because now there's a lot of swerve that's going to be involved. And so I have to kind of feel how much deflection I'm going to get versus how much swerve I'm going to get. Well, that's where the, that's where the, um, like the practice and the experience comes in. So like for me, if I had to guess from here with that kind of a stroke, I'm going to aim almost fully with backhand English just because I know that, that I'm going to get a little swerve where when I'm closer, I tend to use more, for me, I tend to use more of a front-hand English pivot because it gets me a little more. But if I only use backhand, is there a less of adjustment when I'm closer to the object ball? Um, it's really about finding the right adjustment that's going to take into account the net deflection, the difference between the deflection that's going to go to the, the left and the curve that's going to come back to the right. Could be differences. A, a little bit to the cloth, yeah. You have slick balls and slick cloth. It, 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 it will do a little bit different. It's so like for me with right English on here, I'm going to aim almost totally with backhand English. And again, I wouldn't expect to make this every time, but I'm going to aim just about there and just completely use backhand English. Yeah, see, I, I misjudged that one pretty bad. And that's what can happen. And, and again, for me, if I'm this far away, I don't know. I, I don't like to use, I would try to find a way to not use a lot of right English on this shot. And it's not that I can't, and if I did nothing but hit all these crazy spin shots all the time, I would get pretty good at it. And there's guys in town, there's guys on the tour that use a lot of spin. I would much prefer to hit this with, you know, a little bit of English and maybe take uh, a little tougher shot, you know, on the next ball or something. But, you know, if I had to kind of adjust and figure out where to hit this ball, it's it's just a feel thing. Yeah, even that, like I said, it was too much. And I know that, and I'm such kind of a perfectionist that I can sit here and practice this for five minutes or whatever and, and get it down in my head again, like what the right adjustment is. But I, I really don't even hit them that often. So I'll try one more thing just to see. Yeah. So like, but that, that has to like be in your head all the time. It either has to be very mechanical or you've got to have like just a lot of confidence and a lot of feel to, to be hitting those shots from all kinds of different distances. So I, I, I can spend a lot more time if you guys are here, you know, in, in person as I'm here kind of talking through those concepts. But uh, the main goal is to, to really like to work on it and, and try to work on it from like one or two or three feet away because that's kind of your your main area where you want to be when you're trying to use spin uh, I don't think anybody's going to be successful if they're way back here trying to put a lot of right or put a lot of left spin on the ball it's it's just not it's not worth the inaccuracy that comes with it but again typically if I'm here and you know again if I'm trying to adjust and put a little right English on this to kind of come up the rail toward the five I would normally feel pretty comfortable doing that you know you can see I just put a little right English on it that's twice <laughs> it's actually kind of funny we'll talk about that a little bit next time but you, you, you look at that angle it's like I couldn't shoot a ball in almost at that angle but it is funny when you get those and that burns you enough times you, you try to be very specific about hitting the rail like here and coming into the five or coming straight off the table and just kind of accepting that kind of an angle, which is normally what I would do. I, I, I wouldn't need to come straight up, but 
any kind of got to wrap up here a little bit based on time, but uh, any kind of last minute questions on the English or the compensations? Uh, again, I, you know, I could go on for hours and demonstrate all kinds of stuff and talk about stuff, but there is a lot of good information out there. Joe Tucker's got a great thing on spin. He uses a, a wood block that he created with a laser, and he, and he shows all these different techniques with backhand, fronthand English and all that. Um, a lot of the Filipino players, there's only a, a couple references to it, but they talk about like the Carabao English where they, they're basically lining up a little bit to the left, and then when they come through the ball, they're kind of swiping across the ball. Um, they're very good at that. I don't recommend that to a lot of people just because your stroke then becomes not like straight and repeatable. But again, they've got that so dialed in, it's it's uh, ridiculous. Um, but it, it just get a feel for it, uh, especially when you have, I'll just show you one last thing. You know, when you have these kinds of shots, you know, and I'm just trying to get back up to the center of the table or something. Um, I, I just hate to see people missing them all the time because they're not putting the practice in. So, you know, feel feel what you need to do and just, you know, be able to use some English like that, just something simple to be able to still make the ball and, and move it around. You, you're really not trying to play that often where you're really super spinning the ball or, or doing anything crazy. Uh, it's nice if you can, but you don't. That's not kind of your bread and butter when you're playing. So, all right. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming. Again, if you have any questions, I'll be here for a little while, and uh, we'll talk about position play next time.